notable feature of apes' evolution is huge difference in genetic variation in diversity within each species. We now ask whether the pattern of genetic diversity in the great apes resembles that of our own species. Polymorphisms maintained within the species may indicate evolutionary history of them. For example, steady diversification and slow expansion might result in greater diversity than catastrophic reduction in population size, followed by rapid geographical expansion. We start with looking at how many individuals of different species are still living, so-called census size. For humans it's very easy to do, because humans created nice world population tracking tools, which can be used to get human census size. Although the world population is still increasing, and as you can see in this uh, tracker, the population size in all the most populous countries, such as China, India, USA, Indonesia, is more or less stabilized. The growth rate had peaked in the 1969 and now is in the accelerated decline. The maximum population size is predicted to reach 12 billion in 2050s and will continuously fall after that to the steady state level, which is difficult to predict as of now. Let's look at the population and sense of size of apes. Uh, they are much, much smaller in size numbers than humans. <music> Out of all great apes, chimps and bonobos are the most populous, but their total numbers don't reach even a half a million of individuals. Gorillas are even more rare, rare and inhabit even smaller areas, which makes them even more vulnerable. A survey of Western Equatorial Africa documented a catastrophic decline in numbers due to hunting and ravaging Ebola hemorrhagic fever. And yes, gorillas and chimps uh, suffering from Ebola virus, they can be infected. Orangutans' numbers are declining rapidly as they are critically endangered and very hard to impossible to find in the wild jungle and mostly confined to several orangutan refuges protected by Malaysian and Indonesian governments. This sad fact gives the understanding of great ape diversity a vital and urgent purpose beyond the academic activities of primate taxonomists. Genetic analysis of the apes' populations shows that intraspecific diversity in great apes is much, much greater than in humans. Phylogenies drawn from the mitochondrial DNA illustrate dramatically reduced diversity in humans compared with the great apes. The difference may represent a difference in population history, such as recent dramatic contraction of numbers of humans down to mere 1,000 breeding pairs followed by a rapid expansion from a founder population. The de genetic diversity within one group of chimpanzees inhabiting one forest is typically larger than genetic diversity within the entire human population. The same observations are true for other great apes. This remarkable fact, fact tells us that in the past humans as species were less successful on the backdrop of other competing apes and at one point were driven to the verge of the near-complete extinction. The long-term effective population size or the number of interbreeding individuals within population might be used to estimate evolutionary success of the species. The estimates of the long-term effective population size show that despite the fact that humans currently outnumber all other hominoids by several orders of magnitude, the large human population is a relatively recent phenomenon. If effective population sizes were to be used as the measure of evolutionary success of species, then we could say that most other hominoids were outnumbering humans up to about 100,000 years ago, or possibly even as late as 10 or 20,000 years ago because time to most recent common ancestor for any autosomal locus is expected to be four times the effective population size in generations, the coalescence time of chimpanzees 
loci are typically more than 2 million years, predating the speciation split with bonobos, whereas most human gene trees have coalescence times younger than 1 million years ago. This is you, and these are your ancestors, a huge pyramid stretching into the past and balancing right on your head. How many ancestors do you have? Well, you have two parents, four grandparents, and eight great-grandparents. Four generations back, your direct ancestors total 30. If we continue down this line, doubling every step, just 40 generations ago, we'd find a trillion ancestors all living at the same time, which is ridiculous. That's not only more people than have ever been alive, it's more stars than are in the Milky Way. Since our species came on the scene 200,000 years ago, there have been maybe seven or 8,000 generations of humans leading up to you. So where are all your missing ancestors? Clearly there's been some inbreeding. We're not talking banjo playing King of Spain, Cersei, Jamie inbreeding, but every family tree inevitably grows forks. Before Tinder, choices for mates were often limited to as far as you could walk. Even people like Charles Darwin and Albert Einstein married their first cousins. Because so many people with shared ancestors have reproduced, our number of actual ancestors is much smaller than what simple math tells us. If we replace that with fancy math, factoring in how people moved and lived and paired up, life expectancy, trade, geography, Genghis Khan, we find something interesting. Every human alive today shares a common ancestor in their family tree, and this person lived only around 3,000 years ago. That's right, next time you get a fight with a stranger on the internet, just remember that you share the same great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother. But we don't know who that person was. The math tells us they must have existed, but they didn't leave fossils or artifacts or like a note or something. So writing birthday cards for each of your 7.4 billion great, 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 great grandchildren would have been a nice gesture. But we all carry a record of our ancestors in our genes. Because DNA is copied over and over, every so often a mistake is written in. You know how when you make a copy of a copy, it doesn't come out as sharp? Like that. But since most of our DNA can be changed without affecting how things work, many of these mutations slip through to the next generation. These genetic changes accumulate at a steady rate through time. So scientists can read them like a molecular clock and estimate how much time has passed. And which changes individuals share tell us how closely or distantly related they are. Humans seem really different, but on a DNA level, we're remarkably similar. Groups of chimps in Central Africa living right next to each other show more genetic variation than we find in the entire human population. Now, this genetic similarity tells us that our species is new in the big scheme of things, and that at one point our population was small, maybe as few as 10,000 of us. To put that in perspective, that's only a third of your average Bruce Springsteen crowd. Sorry, boss. Today, any two humans only differ by about one out of a thousand DNA base pairs. But our genome is so big, that's still millions of single letter differences, or SNPs, for single nucleotide polymorphism. We tend to see combinations of these changes, chunks of SNPs associated with different geographic locations. Now, companies that test your DNA ancestry, they read thousands of these single letter changes in your genome to make a sort of signature of your unique genetic variation. Then they compare your signature to thousands of reference individuals from various parts of the world, and do a bunch of fancy math to see which parts of your genome most likely came from certain geographic areas. My genetic results pretty much look like this. My ancestors on both sides of my family are from Northern Europe and Scandinavia, which explains my last name, why I'm tall, why I don't tan, and also why I carry more Neanderthal DNA than two thirds of people. If you're confused why I have Neanderthal DNA, you should watch our last video. I didn't find any surprises, but many people learn about ancestry they didn't know they had. Where we come from isn't always obvious on the outside, but DNA doesn't lie. Before using math, we identified an ancestor not too long ago that's related to all of us. 
But that person's genetic influence has been shuffled so much, it's invisible in our DNA today. Is there someone whose genes have been passed on, unbroken to today? Some leftover fingerprint from the mother of everyone alive? There is. You have a 47th chromosome. It lives in mitochondria. The powerhouse of the cell. Okay, so we're doing that again. Mitochondria used to be free swimming. They have their own genetic material. Unlike your other 46 chromosomes, there's no shuffling when it's passed between generations. And what's more, all your mitochondria came from your mother's egg, not your father's sperm. They trace an unbroken line of ancestors stretching back through every female in your family tree. By comparing the changes that have accumulated over millennia, we find the most ancient human mitochondrial DNA comes from Africa, where our species originated. We can even trace it back to one woman about 150,000 years ago. Other homo sapiens females lived alongside her, but only her lineage lives on today. All other homo sapiens lineages are extinct. This is mitochondrial Eve, and every single one of us descend from her. In the truest sense, we really are family, even if we're just hundredth cousins or something. But our ancestry isn't just branches stretching into the past, it's also a tree that extends into the future. Today we have more power to mold that future down to the genetic level than we've ever had before.